Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. My name is Andrew Kruger, and I am part of the Foster School's alumni engagement team. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's Lunch and Learn with Professor Lance Young. Lance returned to the Foster School in 2003 after earning his PhD at the University of Rochester. I say returned because Lance earned his MBA right here at the Foster School of Business in 1997. His areas of academic expertise include behavioral finance, business valuation, financial markets, growth management, and venture capital. Like our other faculty presenters in the fall quarter, Lance is a winner of Foster's highest teaching honor, the PACAR Award. If you've experienced Lance in the classroom, you'll know that the accolades don't end there. He has received Professor of the Year distinction in the Foster School's undergraduate, full-time, evening MBA, hybrid MBA, technology management MBA, and global executive MBA programs, most of them multiple times. He has also won the Charles E. Summer Outstanding Teaching Award and the Ron Crockett Award for Excellence in Graduate Teaching. In 2015, he was named to Poets and Quants list of favorite business school professors. One of the students who nominated him for that list wrote, Lance is an unassuming, brilliant mind. And he has such a unique style and energy for teaching that students walk away from his classes confident and excited about finance. Lance, thank you for being here with us today. Take it away. Andrew, thank you so much. You're far, far too kind, far too kind. So welcome everybody. What I'd like to uh, talk about today are uh, some timeless issues. Uh, and when Andrew uh, approached me and said, uh, would you like to do this? I said, yeah. And he said, what would you like to talk about? And I said, I can tell you exactly what I want to talk about. And he said, well, why is that? And I said, because these are the questions that come up constantly. They're the questions that come up when I talk to bankers and when I talk to private equity folks, when I talk to founders and when I talk to my friends uh, when we go on vacation, when I talk to my cousin at Christmas time. Uh, they're questions that relate to earnings and cash flow, right? And questions like, why do we need both? I mean, we do, right? We learn in accounting, we learn all about earnings and then we learn all about cash flow. And we know that they're different. And I often ask the students, you know, why are they different? And I usually get answers like, well, we, you know, they're, they're we're pretty sure they're different, but uh, the why is a little fuzzy. And even more broadly speaking, the why we need both is a sticky issue. Right, I, I talk to uh, lots of different people from founders to private equity, to venture capital, to uh, bankers. And I get lots of different reads on these things for earnings and cash flow. I get uh, bankers will say things like, well, we don't care about earnings. We only want cash flow, cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. The rest is nonsense. And you talk to private equity people and get the opposite answer. And people say, well, you know, we worry about earnings. We worry about EBIT and EBITDA and cash flow, uh, not so much. So which is it? Uh, I think I'm gonna convince you today, it's both, right? We absolutely have to have both, but more broadly speaking, what does any of this have to do with, for instance, the value we build for shareholders or the amount of cash that's currently sitting on the balance sheet, right? So what I wanna do is address these issues uh, and, and talk about them, but in a different way, uh, in a different way than uh, you may have heard, uh, them discussed before, unless you happen to have had me in class in the last couple of years. And that is, I'm gonna talk about it in the context of a diagram, right? If we were uh, in school here at Foster learning about internal combustion engines, I don't know why we would be, but if we were, I, I can guarantee there would be diagrams of engines on the board, right? Or on the screen here in a remote format. And that way the instructor and me could point at points of the engine and, and talk about how the whole thing worked. And I noticed a couple of years ago that we didn't have something like that uh, for finance. And that's kind of a problem because finance is a lot more abstract than an engine. I mean, it's fairly easy to picture an engine without a diagram, but kind of hard to picture a firm, right? And so what I hope to do is to, to show you this diagram, show you in context, uh, all of these uh, issues in the context of this diagram. And uh, so let's get started. Let's get started. Let me share the screen and show you this diagram. All right, so this is the diagram or set of diagrams actually that uh, I'm referring to. And 
Uh, this is a, a, an example that I use from class. It's a, it's a, a company called McGregor Carbon that uh, this was started by some friends of mine. The company's not really important here. It's the diagram that's really important. So what does the diagram show real briefly before uh, we jump into the issues? The diagram shows that a firm looks like this, right? A firm uses assets in a value chain with employees to generate outcomes like sales, earnings, and cash flow, right? And these assets here, right? We employ the people to use the assets in this value chain. Now, what's a value chain? Well, a value chain is just a list of tasks that the firm performs, really. So if you imagine clicking here on these elements of this value chain, you get a expanded picture of what this firm does. So what does this firm do? do? Well, this particular firm uh, makes a substance called a metachar. It's a charcoal substitute. And then they do it in a really environmentally friendly way. And it turns out this stuff is a lot more absorbent than charcoal. So how do they make it? Well, they bring in wood chips here and they uh, unload the wood chips and they put the wood chips in inventory. We say that happens here on day zero. And then their employees and uh, the, the manager here uh, use this special device they've created called, a, they call it the furnace, but it produces this charcoal substitute metachar. And then they put it on a truck and they send it off to their customers who then subsequently pay. Right, so what this shows is that this process of sort of generating the revenue and then the cash flow, all right, shows up here in our gauges, right? And the gauges show the sales and then the all the expenses, the COGS and the SG&A down to the EBIT, and then the investments that have to be made. And finally, the free cash flow. And you'll notice from seeing this, I know all of you have seen this uh, treated as a formula in classes, but I treat it less as a formula here and more as a framework. Of course, it is a formula. You use it to compute things, no question. But what it's really showing us here is the dashboard that has the gauges on it. And it has an earnings gauge and a free cash flow gauge. And what these are doing is they're collecting all of the activity that's going on in our value chain here. So you can see where the sales is generated here upon shipment. And then the cost of goods sold right along with the sales is this other, the cost of the stuff on the truck. You can see that shows up right here, the sales and the cost of goods sold. And you can see where all the expenses here are incurred. Right? The SG&A, selling general administrative expenses and depreciation expenses. You can see here in their marketing and sales part of their value chain, they have a sales force and their SG&A and they use computers and phones for some depreciation on those. Right? And their firm infrastructure, the CFO and the CEO, and they generate SG&A. We take all those SG&A tags and we add them all up they comprise the SG&A part of our dashboard. Then of course there's taxes and that gets us down to our EBIT or the firm's earnings here. And then there's the investments the firm has to make, buy more inventory for next time, right? Investments in accounts receivable, for instance, the building, the furnace, and finally we get to the free cash flow and the free cash flow then go back to this thing we call the ticket stack. And the ticket stack, you can think of like an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper that hangs off the door of the firm and it shows who owns all this stuff, right? It shows who owns the free cash flow that's coming in in the future and who owns these assets, right? And the way the ticket stack works is any free cash flow that comes into the firm comes in from the top down. So the free cash flow goes to pay the debt holders first. And once the debt holders are satisfied, any remaining free cash flow would go to the equity holders. All right? And likewise, if the firm is shut down, the assets of the firm would be sold off, right? And the proceeds of selling off these assets for their market value would then likewise go down to pay the debt holders first and any remaining uh, funds would be going to the equity holders. So we wanna think of this diagram as showing the market value of the assets and then all of the future free cash flow that the firm might ever produce. 
So if we compute the value of all this free cash flow, the discounted present value of all the free cash flow, for instance, uh, that value would be the value of the firm's tickets or debt and equity, the enterprise value of the firm. Right? And if that value happens to be more than the liquidation value of the assets, we say the firm has some value add, that they're building value for the shareholders. They could take, say, $100 million worth of assets and produce expected future free cash flows that are worth more than $100 million. That would mean the firm has positive value add, whereas the opposite is also true. If value of the future expected free cash flows is less than the market value of the assets and the firm is actually destroying value, right? So that's the diagram. That's what it's showing us, right? And we can use it to discuss these kinds of issues related to earnings and cash flow or any other issues we want to talk about for the firm. Those of you who have had me in class know that uh, we've been using this diagram uh, in classes like entrepreneurial finance and, and mergers and acquisitions to really dig into a lot of these issues. And I think that this particular issue is related to cash flow and earnings it, it is really amenable to this diagram. So what is the difference? What is the difference then between this earnings figure, right? And this free cash flow figure, why do we need them? Maybe we only need one and not the other. Well, I hope to convince you we're gonna need both. Right, so let's take a look at this particular diagram or sub diagram. And it's showing sort of the, uh, the inbound logistics operations and outbound logistics here at this, this firm. But this firm is indicative of a lot of firms. They bring in inventory, they work on the inventory and then they ship it out to the customer and the customer later pays. So what's the difference between earnings and cash flow? Well, the first thing to notice is that the cash flow, the actual amounts uh, uh, of cash exchange happen here and here, right? The firm pays for the inventory they're bringing in here. And for this firm, it happens on day 20 here, day 20 after uh, the arrival of the inventory on day zero. Then they ship later, but there's no cash changing hands on shipment. They have to wait for their customers to pay them. So there's money out the door here and money in the door here. But notice the time difference. It's 110 days between the time the inventory is paid for and the time the customer actually pays. So now what does that have to do with earnings and cash flow? Well, imagine for a second uh, a really, uh, a, a simple business like this and imagine you don't know anything about earnings. For instance, for instance my cousin. Right, my cousin, uh, he runs a, a weld shop. It's a very profitable weld shop, although uh, he doesn't really have any training in business, so he doesn't really realize that. So he started his business and he didn't even think about an accounting system, doesn't know anything about accrual basis accounting. I mean, why would he? He's a trained welder. That's what he does. That's what he focuses on. And he came to me and he said, look, I have this problem. Right? I seem to always either be broke, I'm paying money out, or I'm getting money in. Paying money out and getting money in. And I can never tell whether I'm making any money. I mean, I'm, he thinks, oh, you know, I'm, sometimes I'm writing these big checks, I'm broke, I'm broke, I'm broke. And he gets checks in, he thinks I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich. And it drives him up the wall. Right? How can he get a handle on whether he's actually bringing in enough to cover the cost of the things that he's spending money on, right? And I mean, this, this really is a serious heartburn for somebody that is trying to run a business without earnings, right? What he needs here is to line up all of the expenses with the revenues as if they happened at the same time. Right, that's what earnings does. And the accountants tell us we should find the, part, the spot here in this whole chain of events where the revenue is earned. That is, the company has performed all the services they need to perform and are simply waiting on payment. So we find that point here at shipment, then all we have to do is line up all of the expenses whenever they were paid for right, as if they happened on this day, right? So we would take, say, 
the SG&A expenses and line them up all on top of, pardon me, all on top of this shipment date, right? Even though the inventory, for instance, is paid for back here, right? Even though the customer will pay out here, even though the employees are paid on the 10th and the 25th of the month, even though the building was purchased a long time ago, right? We'll take all of these expenses and line them up here at the point of sales. And that's what we call earnings, right? And it's not net income here, notice, because there's no interest deducted. That comes later. What we're talking about here is the firm's earnings or EBIT after tax, right? And that accomplishes what my cousin needs accomplished because then you can see the amount of revenue that's coming in and all of the expenses it took to generate that revenue, regardless of when they're paid for, all lined up to see if the revenue covers the cost of generating the revenue, right? But that's not the whole story. That can't be the whole story, right? As soon as we learn about that, I think uh, what, what I've taught, the limited accounting that I've taught is where people get uncomfortable because we're lining everything up as if it happened at the same time, as if the revenue was paid for or the revenue came in at the same day, the cost of goods sold and all the SG&A expenses were paid. We know that's not true. So we can't just rely on this earnings gate. Right? Because there's also questions of, well, how much cash flow is there to actually do things like pay the shareholders or pay the interest on the debt or pay the principal on the debt? Right? How much do we need to actually spend now in terms of building up our inventory for expected sales later? That's what we call net investment here. Right? And it means or refers to right, the investments we need to make in these assets to operate in the future. And that's another important part about the diagram here. The diagram is always oriented at the future. All of this out here is the future, not the past. And so what we want to know is if we're going to be selling this pattern of sales in the future, how much are we going to need in assets to actually achieve that. And these are the investments net of the depreciation that's necessary. So if the assets are going up, if our working capital is going up, for instance, or if our fixed assets are going up, then we have to make investments. And when we're done, when the investments are made, now we're back to a cash flow figure. And this cash flow figure can then go somewhere. And where is that somewhere? Well, it's to pay the ticket stack. So the interest and principal go to the debt holders and any dividends go to the equity holders, right? So the idea here is that we need both of these gauges. We've got to have both of these gauges. We've got to have the earnings gauge and we've got to have this free cash flow gauge because they tell us different things. They answer different questions. The earnings here is answering the question, does the revenue cover the cost of generating the revenue? Such an important thing to know. Right, this is, it made my cousin's life vastly easier just getting a decent accounting software because now he can line these things up and see if he's generating enough from uh, the revenue to cover all the costs it took to generate that revenue, right? And he can also see, oh, there's investments that I need to make on top of that that actually determine whether I have free cash flow to pay out or not. For instance, if the investments or if the assets are growing because the sales are growing, for instance, then he'll need to make investments in working capital or CapEx that will eat up some of the cash flow that he could otherwise pay out to his mortgage holders or to himself as equity, right? So that shows us 
I think sort of as a practical matter, why we have to have both. And you can see why some industries might want to focus on one versus the other. Of course, bankers are ultimately interested in collecting interest in principle. So the amount of free cash flow around is very important to them and they focus on it a lot. Private equity outfits are very often say interested in turning companies around. So they're interested in things like earnings potential, right? But we need to have both, right? We need to have both. Now, one of the other things that comes up in this context, right, is, well, what about profit? Well, that's kind of interesting because here we have a diagram of the firm and there doesn't appear to be any profit, right? There's these earnings and they often get confused for profit, but it turns out this isn't profit. The earnings is advisably called earnings and not profit, mostly because it's not profit. So what's missing? It looks like we've got everything. It looks like we're looking at the sales and there's the cost of goods sold. And I've sort of mechanically gone through all of the various expenses they might have. We're not missing anything here. We've got the sales force and the CEO, the CFO's salary. What's missing? What's missing is that these assets are all sitting around tied up in the business and can't be liquidated. If they are, then the business doesn't function. They won't be able to bring in inventory and sell it to their customers because they won't have trucks or buildings, or furnaces, employees, right? So these assets, right, that the employees are using are crucial and they're stuck there. Right? The assets are stuck there in the business. This is the choice that the value add here is highlighting, right? The firm has some expected future free cash flows all the way out to kingdom come perhaps, right? And if the value of those free cash flows is more than what we can get for selling off the assets, we call that positive value add. But think about that for a second. That choice is saying you can either liquidate the firm, take the value of the assets now, or keep these assets here and not return this fund, these funds to the people who put up the money in the first place, the debt and the equity holders. But that means um, you get the free cash flow. So these assets have to remain in the firm and that isn't free. There's an opportunity cost to that. Right? And that opportunity cost is accounted for here in this value add. In other words, we have to constantly ask ourselves whether it's worth it to have all this money tied up generating free cash flows. And one simple way to think about it is to ask, to say, look, if the ROA of the firm is bigger than the cost of capital consistently in the future, then we could say this firm is building value. They're generating more in return on assets, right? Recall return on assets would just be this EBIT times one minus T divided by the market value of the assets, the return you get from using these assets. In other words, here's what you get out in EBIT, divide by the market value of the assets is ROA. You could do a similar computation with free cash flow as well, right? But it's measuring the return. What do the people who say the equity holders and the debt holders who have put up these assets, what do they get in return? Well, they get EBIT. Is it enough relative to the value of the assets? Well, that depends on the so-called cost of capital. The cost of capital is what these folks who are holding the debt and equity, the banks and mutual funds, for instance, right? whether they're actually getting enough return here to cover their alternative use of money. They could, for instance, liquidate the firm, take all of this, all of these, the value of all these assets and put them 
elsewhere in the capital market at similar risk. And that means they could get something like the weighted average cost of capital in return. Right, so if the firm can generate more with the assets than the competing uses of the assets could generate, we say the firm is building value. So that connects here profit to earnings in cash flow. Right, the profit can only be really thought of here as not the earnings but the earnings in some sense net of the opportunity cost of having all of these assets sitting there on the shop floor of the firm. And that creates some kind of uh, interesting dynamics that are visible on the diagram that are really kind of hard to talk about without a diagram. For instance, remember these assets here, aren't these aren't book values, these are market values. We're not just trying to reproduce the financial statements here. Right? These assets we're recording on the diagram as their market value. And that's kind of significant here right? because their market value is what we would get if we liquidated the firm. Right, So this idea of comparing the market value of the assets to the market value of the future free cash flows right, highlights that if the free, if the firm is to build value here, it has to generate more coming back than there is going in or tied up within the firm. Okay. Now, of course, that doesn't explain this bit. This excess cash. Well, what is that? Well, remember that this value add here is based on future expected free cash flows. It's the total value of all the future expected free cash flows would be the value of this ticket stack. And that's what we're comparing to the market value of these assets. That's what gives us this value add here, right? But what about cash? Right. What about cash? Does that mean, does it mean if we have a lot of value add, does that mean we necessarily have a lot of cash? Well, that means we got to take a look at the rest of this diagram, right? What if there is free cash flow, but it's not being paid out to the debt holder, right? Suppose there is no debt or there's just none due right now. And suppose there was no dividends. Right? Or suppose there's just extra free cash flow after paying the interest, the principal, and the dividends. What happens to it then? Well, any leftover free cash flow defaults up to this excess cash. Right? Now, that's different from this cash because this cash we regard as the cash they have to have on hand, say, to make transactions like the tills in the registers. This is excess. Right? It's stored up free cash flows from the past. And that's a different thing. That's a different thing, a widely different thing than value add. For instance, you could have a startup with lots of value add, but negative free cash flows for the next couple of years. It's just that those negative expected future free cash flows are gonna be likely to be offset by even bigger positive future free cash flows in the future. Right? That firm might have no excess cash around at all, but lots of value add, right? Because again, the value add is the difference between the expected future free cash flows and the market value now. The excess cash just represents free cash flow that has happened in the past, but hasn't yet been paid out. So you could imagine the converse situation. You could imagine a situation with a firm with no value add or negative value add. How does that happen? Well, we see lots of cases, particularly in the early 1980s and late 1970s uh, that had really badly governed firms. They had CEOs here who were driving the firm and the CEO was very much insulated from the shareholders. The board of directors may be very insulated from the shareholders and they were consequently doing things, consuming a lot of free cash flow in waste, right? And as a result, these firms 
right? Even though they had a whole bunch of excess cash, think of RJR Nabisco at the end of the 1980s, it actually had diminished or even negative value add. And this in fact attracted corporate raiders, right? Who saw that they could increase value add by getting rid of excess assets, disgorge the excess cash and actually make money. How did they do it? Well, the ticket stack, the equity value reflected this entrenched management, low expected future free cash flows, a lot of excess assets. So they were able to buy up the equity at this cut rate price, fire the CEO, change the asset composition, eliminate the waste and build value. Right? You could even see kind of one case that we do in mergers and acquisitions where <laughs> the, key the key value, the key asset on the balance sheet was excess cash, right? And the people that wanted to uh, come in and raid the company would have uh, been able to buy the equity at a discount to the excess cash. How is that possible? Because excess cash isn't the same thing as value add. And it's not the same thing as the value of the equity in the debt, right? And lastly speaking, we can see that things, if things happen here to the market value of the assets, right? That affects the firm's value add, even though it needn't affect the firm's free cash flow or its earnings. For instance, you could have a firm that has a fixed asset. Maybe in this context of this firm, it's this building or the land the building is built on. If this land that this building is built on suddenly becomes vastly more valuable in an alternative use, right? Think of this little firm being located somewhere in South Lake Union right before Amazon came in, right? The real estate that they're on suddenly becomes extremely valuable. The value skyrockets. Well, it doesn't do anything necessary to, to the firm's EBIT or free cash flow, particularly if they own the asset, but what happens to the value add? Well, now suddenly we're sitting on an extremely valuable asset, right? And it's easy to imagine that asset's value could outstrip the value of the future expected free cash flows. And that means that the value add is actually dropping. Right? And that shows us something. I think it really shows us the connection between the actual profit of the firm, which is this value add, The earnings of the firm, which is the difference between the revenue and the expenses, right? do the revenues cover the cost of generating the revenues, and the cash flow that the firm produces, including that amount that builds up over time if it's not paid out. Okay. So with that, I think, Andrew, I think we should turn it over for questions. So. All right, um, Lance. So, I, you've just you've just put a lot of effort into this. So, I, so I want to make sure we start with something light. Sure. A, a softball question for you, uh, Lance. Where's the Perrier? Well, we're, we're we're we've switched to Lacroix here for pandemic reasons, I guess, mostly because it's easily available. But so no Perrier, but Lacroix by the case. By the case. All right. Uh, shifting gears. Do you have any thoughts on how some of the companies in the stock market seem to have valuations that significantly outpace the value of a company's future free cash flow? Well, I think the uh, the big example of this recently is, is is GameStop, right? I think this is the sort of the, the classic uh, market bubble, right? So the idea here is that People in the capital market here bid up the price of GameStop so in this sort of quote unquote raid on the hedge funds. They bid up the price of GameStop. Now, the idea was that a lot of the hedge funds had borrowed shares. They had taken shares, borrowed them and sold them. And so then now they needed to cover their short positions. And so this price increase that was sort of generated in the capital market took the value of this ticket stack and increased it way off the value of the future expected free cash flows, right? And I mean, this is what created a lot of Sturm and Drang in, uh, in, in that episode was that this is a this was a bubble, but we got to be careful, 
right? The fact that they managed to, uh, you know, the, 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 the folks, the Robin Hood traders and others, others the individual traders uh, from Reddit that were bidding up the price of uh, GameStop stock had a huge headwind, right? And we can see what happened, right? The headwind is that if the value of the tickets here, the debt and the equity exceed the present value of the future expected cash flows, then there becomes a huge profit opportunity here in the capital market. That is to sell this stuff, right? To sell these shares, right? And that's exactly what happened. The price was, they can hold it up above the value of the expected future cash flows for a while, but it's gonna come right back down, right? And the reason why is not because of the law of gravity, it's because there are lots of profits to be made from selling overpriced equity. Right, so we are really, really skeptical about the notion that there is ever going to be somebody who manages to get uh, a capital market valuation or the value of a ticket stack that actually exceeds the value of the expected future free cash flow for any length of time. Right, because if it does, it's going to attract all sorts of attention from hedge funds and others to drive the price back down. Of course, the reverse is also true. If you've got a chronically undervalued company, that's exactly what folks like Warren Buffett are out there looking for. They're looking for companies that actually have value add possibilities, but their future free cash flows are sort of valued low by the market. And this is what the private equities, you know, uh, fondest wish is to find companies like that. So you can buy up the equity cheap and change things about the company to make the equity value go up, make the value add increase. What's next? What's next? Let's see here. I'm gonna go with a question from Emily. How does the value chain change for software companies where they aren't turning inventory into product, if at all? Yeah. See, this is the, we, we do a bunch of this in entrepreneurial finance, right? So what happens if, you don't need any of this stuff, right? What happens if you don't need a building, like a factory? You don't need these manufacturing employees. You don't need this high-tech furnace thing. You don't need these trucks. You don't need this inventory. You don't need accounts payable. You don't need accounts receivable. Well, that happens to look like firm with, say, very little accounts receivable, maybe no real requirement for cash on hand, no inventory payables, accruals, or fixed assets. Huh. There's our software company, right? Because what is our software startup is gonna have a, a look that's a lot like this, right? They're gonna have maybe some sales force, maybe marketing operation, uh, some coders here. I haven't put them here, but uh, when I do this for software companies, the, this ends up being replaced with a simple leased building and some people writing code on computers don't need any of this stuff, right? And that's where we have the makings of a unicorn. Right, because you've got very little in the way of required assets. Right, maybe the only real asset you need to have on hand is some cash or excess cash here, right? So that you can pay for the SG&A, because of course you don't need cost of goods sold. You're not going to have a lot of depreciation or working capital or capex. Probably not a lot of taxes either, too, early on. So there you go. This firm could conceivably have very, very little in the way of assets. And in a software company, you've got extremely low marginal cost, right? And a high fixed cost. So that means that early on, you've got some negative free cash flows for a couple of years until the software is up and running. But once it starts to scale, if people buy the software, then you get big, big positive free cash flows. And so you end up in a situation or could end up in a situation with very little assets, but a huge value of the future free cash flows. And that leads to this massive value add. That's what we call a unicorn. That's what we call a unicorn. Very little required assets, huge free cash flows because there's very little in marginal cost, right? Once the software is written, you have some overhead to cover and the revenue just pours straight to the bottom line. So that's the idea with the software company, or at least the, the successful stock software company. And I think the diagram, again, really helps with that because you can see that the profit comes from this huge value add. And you could imagine a software company trading at a very high price, for instance, or 
being taken public for a high price or raising venture capital at high prices because they're generating big, big positive future expected cash flows after some negative free cash flow. So they might have negative earnings and negative cash flows for a year or two, but then you get the big positive and that creates this huge value add. Andrew, what do you think? Next What's up. Next? Yeah, next up a question from Lawrence. Now that we see companies trading at very high prices, does this insulate them at all from corporate raiders? I think that depends. I think that depends. Uh, I think the premise of the question sort of presumes that uh, the high the high prices uh, uh, are, are making sort of the equity kind of hard to buy. And I and I and I, and I grant you that, right? If if things are fairly priced, the corporate raiders are bored, right? And this is the gripe of the private equity industry for the last 20 years, right? Is that early in the 80s, if the you know in the late 70s, early 80s, there was lots and lots of companies where you had uh, situations where the management here driving the bus, so to speak, is heavily, heavily insulated from the actual shareholders here in the capital market who are perhaps largely individual shareholders or not activist shareholders. So they have very little individual incentive to try to get the management to do anything, right? In those kind of situations is what Colbert, Kravis and Roberts was founded on because they could get rid of the management by buying up the equity Right. And in those kinds of companies, they generally had to add a whole bunch of debt, right, to get the free cash flow away from the management uh, so they wouldn't waste it. Right. And in those kind of situations, uh, you could easily see these assets be worth a lot more than the equity. So you could break up the firm or you could reorganize the firm and turn it around. Right. Uh, so I, I guess the uh, here's my thought on that. In that environment, that requires sort of an entrenched management with equity that's kind of uh, undervalued. If the equity is fairly valued or even highly valued, then yeah, that's going to be kind of hard to convince folks to come in and try to turn it around. And so, yeah, I think uh, the high equity prices or uh, high value adds is generally going to discourage these kind of corporate raider companies with a lot of waste, a lot of excess cash lying around, not doing anything or just invested in the capital market is the kind of thing that does attract raiders. As long as you've got some kind of management that is not uh, uh, performing, uh, for instance, you know, Facebook has a lot of cash. I don't think there's any corporate raiders out there after them. Andrew. Next, next up, a uh, question from Dan. When companies choose to outsource parts of the business, what differentiates the successful from the less successful? Outsourcing? Oh, I think that's uh, starting to cross out of my field. Uh, that's uh, the, the sort of the question of outsourcing is to, uh, again, comes back to this in the, in the end, this value add, right? And the thing about outsourcing is it might improve your ROA if, right, if it's not just aimless cost cutting. Right? If you've got a aimless kind of cost cutting going on, then you know, outsourcing to outsource needn't necessarily build value because it may end up, although it reduces, say, SG&A goes down, uh, if you can't serve your customers or uh, you let your competition uh, get the better of you, then you could also see future sales drops that are at least as big as the uh, the cut in expenses. I, I can I think of one particular instance in, in a private equity context, right? where uh, not so much outsourcing, but downsizing took place, right? There was a lot and lot of downsizing that was really cutting the place to the bone and ended up letting the competition come in, provide better service and killed this company's revenue. So the private equity fund that ended up buying it or had bought it ended up destroying a huge amount of value. So I would say that outsourcing, if it increases value, increases value add is good, right? Now, that said, it's good for the people that own the equity. For the people who actually work in the value chain of the company, it's not good, right? It's unambiguously bad because now they're out of a job and they've got to have to go find something else new. So there are multiple sides to this. And I think one of the benefits of the diagram, at least in class, when I start adding all the people here, right, is that there's people here 
who benefit from that outsourcing, maybe as long as it increases value add, but there are people here and I don't think that we can ignore them and they are gonna be hurt by that. And we need to consider that. Andrew. This one actually has to do with your diagrams, Lance. Any thoughts on scaling size of the different boxes to help show graphically where there are opportunities and problems? Ah, I think that's an awesome idea. And we actually are gonna we do that or are working on doing that with the Student Investment Fund. With the Student Investment Fund, we actually have really elaborate series of diagrams, right? So we've got this diagram, but it's all built uh, in such a way that you can click on the uh, value chain and get taken down to successively high, lower levels or increased levels of detail. And uh, one of the things that, that we're gonna, we wanna do and uh, I think we'll do is display these assets by sort of size of market value, right? Uh, sort of uh, the, just like you say, the, the, the scale of the uh, sort of the, the fixed assets would be proportional to their value, right? And the value add like, likewise here. Uh, that makes it kind of an interesting display of where the value actually is and where it's coming from. It's kind of cool. Next up, question from Katie. What would lead to negative earnings and positive free cash flow or the opposite, positive earnings, but negative free cash flow? Okay, so let's do the negative earnings, positive free cash flow bit. Suppose for a minute that we had a company that currently has no revenue, but lots of expenses, so they have negative earnings, okay? Now, when we say no revenue, that doesn't mean they haven't received any cash from customers, right? Remember here, revenue is what's leaving on the truck, right? We hop up on the back of the truck, count up what's on the back of the truck, multiply by the sales price, that's the revenue. You could easily have situations where customers pay, say, in advance for a custom item, for instance, or customers, uh, Starbucks recently did this in a deal with Nestle. They, they took in a huge amount of cash uh, from Nestle up front in, or in an agreement to provide uh, sort of services to our uh, to, uh, joint venture with Nestle in the future, right? So they have deferred revenue. Right, so they've taken on a bunch of cash early on, but they won't be able to recognize it as revenue until they actually make the sales. And so on the diagram, what that shows is no revenue, negative earnings, but a big negative free or working capital change here, because you would have so if sort of an, another liability here, uh, they call them convenience liabilities, like accounts payable and accruals, but it would be customer advance payments that would be shooting through the roof. Right, and that increase in that uh, uh, that liability would then show up here, and so you'd see this big positive free cash flow, even though the earnings are negative. Of course, the opposite could also be true. Obviously, you know, you got you got lots and lots of say. You're making uh, lots of sales, right? Uh, uh, well, which way do I want to go now? So this is positive free cash flow, negative earnings. You can have positive earnings because you're making lots of sales, but there are huge investments you have to make in the future, right? You have to build new buildings or buy up a bunch of inventory uh, for sales next period. That can create situations where you have negative free cash flow and positive uh, or earnings. Although, I mean, you know, and it's, it's useful to say this over the long term, if we measured earnings over decades, right, if it was a question of, of Microsoft producing earnings not for a quarter or a year, but for 20 year period, right, if we had an income statement over a 20 year period, then earnings and free cash flow would be the same thing, right, they would approach the same number. And the reason is because these investments in assets are sort of temporary in a sense, right? In the sense that these assets, these investments in assets uh, uh, aren't permanent. They, they can go away over time. Imagine a lemonade stand. You'd have all this stuff for your lemonade stand, like the fixed assets, but as soon as you know you take down the lemonade stand, you know, liquidate, it's all over. At that point, the earnings and the cash flow have to be the same thing. So in the long run, they are gonna be the same thing. But if we have a lot of investment or a lot of liquidation going on in any one period or a serious small three, five year time frame, then you can get big differences. 
Next, we're going to head toward cryptocurrency, Lance. Yeah. Some yeah. experts say cryptocurrency is not a true asset. As financial institutions like JP Morgan Chase and some companies, Tesla and PayPal, add crypto to their portfolios, how do firms fairly evaluate an entity? I would say that the blockchain technology behind the cryptocurrency is really kind of interesting and probably very useful. Uh, we're going to be teaching a class on it here at Foster. Um, I don't think the cryptocurrency is particularly useful other than that, right? The blockchain technology might be, but the actual cryptocurrencies I think are largely not particularly useful. Now, some of these uh, outfits like PayPal, uh, you know, let people pay or get paid in, in Bitcoin, I, I guess. I mean, they might as well use gold or something else. Um, I guess I don't really see the, the, the purpose for the Bitcoin. We have money. And there's there's other assets out there. Do I think it's an asset? Yeah, I think it's an asset. I think it's an asset that's likely uh, subject to a lot of variability, huge amounts of variability for various reasons that uh, uh, make it, uh, I think, less useful than it would you know the people sort of seem to think it is. Is my view. Okay. Next one from John. Recent valuations for biotech startups going public have been staggeringly high given the risk for the firms. Can you explain investors' willingness to bid up share prices for these companies? Is there simply a massive amount of money chasing returns at this time? Well, that could be, but I think the other sort of uh, the, uh, the other thing to think about is we have to be careful when we say risk. Right, we have to be careful when we say risk, right? Because uh, I think that a lot of these companies appear to have an enormous amount of idiosyncratic risk, right? Without necessarily having that much systematic risk. Remember that this weighted average cost of capital here refers to the risk of the future free cash flows. And it's not just the risk that things might go bad, right? And that's really not what we mean when we say risk. There's huge amount of variability here that things could go great at these companies or they could end up with situations like total losses here let me draw this better things could go great or you could end up in a situation where you've got oops a total loss That's the total risk the company faces, right? That's this, you know, all the way from great to the total loss. And I think with a lot of these biotech firms, you know, that 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 is big. That's a big, big gap between total loss and great, right? And unfortunately or unfortunately, a lot of that is relative to the firm's uh, uh, idiosyncratic investment projects. In other words, Right, a lot of whether that goes great or goes really, really badly has to do with the science and not the economy. The only kind of risk that ends up getting a discount rate, right, is systematic risk. So there was a, for instance, a biotech company uh, years ago that was working on making a human blood substitute, right, and their cash flows were wildly risky. They were traded OTC, and I think they had a standard deviation of something like six percent a day, six or eight times bigger than the S&P 500 in total volatility, but their beta was close to zero. Remember the beta is measuring how much of this total risk is actually relative to the economy. And this particular company, there was almost no risk relative to the economy, right? It's because blood sells well, whether the economy is good or whether it's bad. If you need blood, you get a transfusion, right? And it happens whether the economy is good or it happens whether the economy is bad, right? But there was all that volatility that's just due to the market's uncertainty about whether the, uh, the science would work. So to a diversified investor, all of that idiosyncratic risk is irrelevant, it's gone, right? And the only people you're really competing against in the capital market are diversified. So the people bidding up those cash flows don't care about whether the science works or not. They don't care about this, these big swings. They care about how much free cash flow is gonna be produced on average and how sensitive to the economy it is. 
finance, those kinds of companies can routinely have really, really volatile cash flows with really, really high valuations and nobody being irrational at all. Unsurprising, Lance, uh, your talk generates a lot of questions. So uh, we've still got some to go. I'm not sure that's good or bad. I was... <laughs> it's good. People love you. They want to hear your opinion. It seems like the value add is heavily dependent on market value. How do you determine market value for a nonprofit organization that has debt but is losing money, negative cash flows? That is a fabulous question, I think. And this gets to the nature of a for-profit firm, and it's this ticket stack, right? See, the ticket stack makes sense in a for-profit firm because you're putting assets in in exchange for tickets, right? So the people who put the assets on the balance sheet were willing to wait for future expected free cash flows. But the key idea here is the people who are consuming the service, right, are the ones paying for it, and they're paying, in the end, the people who own the tickets. But that's not the case with a nonprofit or a not-for-profit. I want to distinguish between nonprofit, which is just firms with negative value add, and not-for-profit, which is firms who are specifically set up not to have a ticket stack and not to have value add for the people who put up the money. The value add in the sense of the not-for-profit firm is for the people who are receiving the value. So the idea is the people who are putting up the value, putting up the assets in the first place, don't expect to get a financial return. There is no ticket stack, right? So the not-for-profit company not spending all the money they raise is a disaster. That's terrible, right? That means you're not doing all the good that you could do. But when I think about not-for-profits, I don't think about them building value in this sense. I think about them effectively using these assets to provide as much good to their end user as possible but that doesn't end up providing a return to the people who put up the assets in the first place they did so for altruistic reasons so it's a very challenging endeavor to be running a not-for-profit firm because you don't have this automatic scorecard right it's not clear uh, in terms of how happy your donors are whether your actual recipients are happy or not so we, have, right. we, need a new, we need a new diagram. When I draw not-for-profits, there's no value add and there's no ticket stack. Lance, we, I, I want to be respectful of your time. So I'm, I'm going to give you three different questions and it's going to be Lance's choice. Okay. Whichever, one you, whichever one intrigues you and you can answer quickly. So we've you got bet. a question about the use of excess cash. Okay. We've got a question about uh, the minimization or essential elimination of taxes by some people. Uh, and how it works in your schematic, or thoughts on the retirement of Liber and uh, the future of its successors like Sonia? Uh, let's talk about excess cash. All right. So uh, what are good or bad uses of excess cash? That's a really good question. So here's, uh, 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 there's two polar reasons why you might have excess cash, right? Uh, one reason, and you see this, uh, uh, in venture capital, for instance, right, is because it's costly to raise equity capital, right? And now what do I mean when it's cost? I don't mean that you have to pay a high rate of return. I mean that there's actual transactions cost. You've got to go find venture capitalists. You've got to sit down with them. You've got to pitch to them. You've got to get them involved. They've got to do due diligence, right? All of that kind of stuff means it's a hassle to raise equity. It's, it's costly in management time and effort, right? And so that being the case, you don't want to do it all the time. So for instance, if we're running a firm and for the first couple of years, right, uh, we don't expect, or first year maybe, we don't expect to have much in revenue. So we're gonna have to raise a bunch of money and then we'll have a little bit of revenue in year two, but we're still gonna have negative free cash flows. Oh, and then we're finally here gonna get some money in in year three. A firm like this might raise money in year one here enough to cover year two. And that means that they're gonna hold some excess cash here and that they're gonna run down this excess cash as they uh, uh, effectively make their investment. So there won't be any interest principal or dividends and this excess cash, the change in excess cash would be negative here, it'd be funding the negative free cash flows, right? So they raise the venture capital and then you use it for 18 months and then hopefully you're now generating cash flow positive. That's one use of excess cash. Right now, that I think uh, 
pretty standard. Uh, uh, nobody's going to complain too much about that. Right now, what happens if you've got a firm that has a really insulated CEO, right? And she is insulated from the shareholders in the sense that she's not responsive. And I don't really mean literally the CEO, but the board, say. Right? This board is very insulated for the shareholders and they're acting, say, in the interest of the debt holders. Right? They might hold tons and tons of excess cash, right? even though the shareholders would like that money back, right? so much so that this firm could have this excess cash on hand uh, and actually have more value in excess cash than the equity. Right? If everybody who owns the equity is an atomistic shareholder and they can't really influence the, the board to pay out the excess cash, then you could easily see the equity in a situation where the equity is trading at a discount to the excess cash because the investors who own the equity know they're not gonna be able to get at the excess cash unless somebody comes along, buys up all of it, fires the CEO and changes the, uh, the policies with regard to the excess cash. That is sort of the, the I don't know if I wanna call it bad, it's a, um, certainly an opportunity for a private equity firm uh, it's certainly not good for these shareholders. It may be very good for the management team and the debt holders they're working on uh, behalf of, but this is the kind of thing that uh, leads to these instances like the movie Wall Street, for instance, where Gordon Gecko is going out to, to, to raid these companies. And, and you know, and before we get too down on Gordon Gecko, he's talking about uh, making these companies more efficient in order to build value add. Right, to stop waste. And uh, while that may be a traumatic thing to go through is in the long term good for, uh, for all of us that we have companies that, are, that aren't just throwing away money. Lance, thank Andrew. you. I know we've gone a little over. We've taken more of your time than I asked you for. No a huge no. thanks My to pleasure. you for doing this. A big thanks to everybody who joined us. Uh, but that's it. Have a great afternoon, everyone, and go dogs. Thanks, everybody.